Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and ever, and to the ages of all ages, Amen. Today's Gospel is read different times throughout the year for various reasons. Sometimes from Matthew, sometimes from Mark. And the message is very important because it has to do with blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Or in other words, the denial of the work of the Holy Spirit in my life. It has to do with uh, speaking against God. It has to do with being stubborn against the will of God. It has to do with many things. Uh, the Lord spoke about unity. And he said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. A kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. So the devil knows this very well. And he makes sure that one of his greatest battles against humanity is division. If there's any tool the devil wants to use, if you think adultery or pornography or alcohol or gambling or theft or any of these sins, quote unquote, that people are very familiar with, they know, oh, that's a sin for sure. Oh, lying, that's a sin for sure. They know what sins are. But if there's anything he really will use truly for the long run to make sure he gets as many down as possible, it will be division and discord. That's the one tool that he uses, and it's his weapon of choice. If he can't get you with the quote-unquote sins you know about, I know this is wrong, adultery is wrong, pornography is wrong, gambling is wrong, I know this is wrong. But if he can't get you with the, I know these are wrong sins, he'll get you with the vision. The vision is the number one threat and weapon against the kingdom of God. The number one. And no wonder that it starts with the letter D, just like as the devil's name starts with the letter D. It's a very, very powerful, subtle weapon. It's not always obvious when it's being used against us. But it's being used against us. And like I said before, it's one of the devil's weapons of choice to divide God's children from one another. From the household to the individual, his or herself, and so on. So, one of the main ways to defeat division is through humility. The devil is not humble. He doesn't know humility. And that's the reason why he fell in the first place. And therefore, when humility is used and practiced and fought for, just like the Lord in His meekness and emptied Himself and gave Himself for us, then unity can be victor. And the vision can lessen and lessen with time. So we want to remember this. We want to remember these three words. Unity through humility. Unity through... I didn't hear most of you. Unity through... Humility. Remember that. So, it's important because Satan knows very well that whatever he can divide, he can dominate. He knows that very well. If he can divide us, he can dominate. He can work in the dark. He can use hidden agendas. He can make people create scenarios in their mind against others. And he can... Just like it's a seed, a weed that is planted and gradually grows into a plant that divides, that ruins the vineyard, he knows how to do that. So remind yourself of that. Every time you find there's some form of division in your life, in your church, in your home, with your spouse, with your children, with your colleagues at work, with you name it, tell yourself, this is the devil knowing how to dominate something. As soon as you fight, as soon as you humble yourself, as soon as you say, it's not about me, as soon as you tell yourself, we have to fight for unity, the devil weakens his stronghold on the matter or the thing or the object or the person he is trying to dominate. Remind yourself of that. He works with the divide and conquer system. This is the devil's principle. Divide, conquer. That's what the gospel said today. And that's what we're talking about right now. Divide and conquer. We need to use the word conquer, but in a different way. In a different way. Unite and conquer. The devil wants to conquer us by dividing us. We can only conquer him by uniting. It's very simple. Very, very simple. Even a young child can understand this. Divide and conquer. That's the devil's way. God's way, unite and conquer. 
And that's why the most important prayer the Lord prayed on Gethsemane, the moments before He was arrested, the day before His crucifixion, He prayed that we may be united. He prayed that we may be one, just He and the Father are one. Very important to remember. Now, sadly, there are so many people not here today to hear this message. But God does not need many. Because like Isaiah the prophet said, God does not need to save by many. God can save by few. God works with the few. Just like when he told Elijah the prophet, there are 7,000 knees who have not yet bent the knee. 7,000 people have not yet bent the knee to bow to idol worship. So God knows how to work through the few, even though it's few. That means that those of us who are here today, this is our job. That means there's a greater work and responsibility upon us. And the devil will fight us even harder to make sure that this message does not leave this church. That this message does not reach the people that are going to come in half an hour, 45 minutes, an hour, and maybe not even today, period. Make sure. Don't just tell them, go to YouTube and listen to the sermon. It's not about YouTube. It's not about audio recordings of sermons. We can listen to thousands upon thousands of sermons. That's not going to do it. That's not going to do it. What's going to do it is each one of us, one person at a time, working to unite with that person to conquer the devil's kingdom, the devil's plots, the devil's plan. Very important. Very important. The Lord said, if a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. He said it, we spoke about it, you understand what it means very, very simply. That's why St. Paul teaches us in Ephesians, and we pray this passage every morning. Those of us who are faithful in fighting to be true prayer warriors, you know you're familiar with your Agbeya by now, and you're going to open up Prime in the morning, and you're going to see that the reading of the Pauline epistle in Prime starts with this, Ephesians chapter 4. He says, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord. St. Paul says, God forbid that I should glory anything except the cross of my Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, I'd rather be a prisoner, a slave, a bondservant of Christ, because in Christ I am free, than to be a prisoner and dominated by the devil and his plans and his plots. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you, beg you, to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. The day you were baptized... The day you were immersed in the consecrated water, the day your sins were forgiven, the sin of Adam and Eve, the moment you were anointed 36 times with holy Mayrun, you were anointed with the Holy Spirit. This was a calling you were called to. He says, walk worthy of this calling. Don't live a life that is under that. If you're called to be an A student, you can't be a C student. You can't be a D student. And like a very famous author once said, the biggest enemy of the best is good. Think, how does that make sense? Things because you need to be the best. You're called to be the best. Jesus said so. He said, be perfect. Being perfect is being the best. The greatest enemy of being the best is when we settle. Well, that's good. That's good enough. There's no such thing as good enough in heaven. Heaven is holiness. And the highway of holiness, as Isaiah the prophet calls it, is a very simple highway. He says, even the youngest child who doesn't know how to walk or crawl, if they get on this path, they won't get lost. It's a very simple path. But we have to strive for it. We're, we're, we're called to be at that level. You're called to be an A Christian. Don't be a C Christian. Don't even be a B Christian. Don't even be an A minus Christian. If Jesus called you to be perfect, that means you have to be an A plus Christian. You're not going to do it alone. It will be by the grace of God working in you. By the Holy Spirit with, with which you have been anointed. That's how it's going to be. So don't say, well, I just want to get into heaven. I just want to make it at the gate of heaven. Just, bring, just you know, shove me in. You know, like in, in those places in the world where they shove the people into the subway with this big, almost like a broom. That's not how heaven is. Jesus says to him or her who overcomes, I'll grant them to sit with me on my throne. He didn't say, I'll grant them to be at the gate. Not at the gate. And that's why the Lord doesn't tell you to come in to the church and just stand far back. Oh, you're not worthy. He wants you to be right with Him. Because when you take His holy body and His blood in the mystery of the Eucharist, regardless of where you're sitting in church, you're united with Him. And whether you like it or not, you're united with every person sitting next to you. 
And that's why the devil can't stand it when we take communion, because communion means it becomes our union together. We commune with Christ, and therefore unite with Christ, and unite with those around us. The devil can't stand us, stand, st can't stand us, of course, but he can't stand that either. And therefore, as soon as the liturgy is done, even before, even halfway through, he will do whatever to cause divisions and discord. Whatever he can. Particularly at the moment of communion or right after it. Between the deacons, between the people, between the servants, between the congregation, between people standing in line for food, between people arguing in the parking lot over how they park their cars, he will do whatever to make sure he divides that communion we just received. Walk worthy of the call with which you were called. I'm sorry, there seems to be a bit of a... With all lowliness and gentleness. See, there's that humility. Be lowly and gentle. If you are having an argument with someone, a colleague, a husband, a wife, a friend, do the, the, the initial, do the Christ-like step. You go and fix it. Well, he's the one who's wrong. He's wrong, not me. She's wrong, not me. Doesn't work like that with Christ. You remember the, the, the two girls that are sisters that died in the church in Egypt, St. Peter and St. Paul Church in Cairo, the Botrosea Church, in December of what is it, 2016, was it? What year was it? 2016, I think. One of the two sisters, and this was told to me by her parents, just a few maybe months before they were martyred, which means that it doesn't just happen, we don't become like that the night before we're dying, or at the moment. This is something we work on regularly. Her, one of her friends got into an argument with her. And her friend was completely wrong, from head to toe. Completely wrong. This girl, the martyr, one of the two sisters, I believe it was Marina, she went that same day, before the end of the day, she went over, walked up the stairs. You know how the, most buildings in Cairo don't have elevators. She took the stairs up to, I don't know what floor it was. She went and buzzed the doorbell of the apartment many times to speak to the girl who was wrong. She wouldn't open the door. She knocked. She wouldn't open the door. So this is when cell phones come to good use. Rather than using them for distractions, she actually sat down on the steps on the floor not too far from the door of the apartment and texted her. She told her, so-and-so, I know you're upset at me. She didn't say, you're wrong, I'm right. She said, I know you're upset at me. I'm just letting you know that I'm going to be sitting here at the step by your apartment door until you open up and speak with me because we have to resolve this problem. She didn't do anything wrong. The mistake was from the other part. But this is where humility comes in to unite people. And sure enough, it took about a while of time, but finally the girl opened the door. They spoke, they hugged, and they reconciled their differences. That's how it works. This is the Christian way of unity. It's not when he realizes his mistake, when she realizes his wrong, then we can talk. When they come and kiss my feet, then we can talk. That's not Christian. That's not what Christ did. Jesus descended from heaven to take our flesh, emptied himself to die for us. When we're the ones who are sinners, he didn't sin. Why should he die on a cross? What did he do wrong to die on a cross? Nothing. He did absolutely nothing wrong. He who is without sin became sin for us. This is the Christian way of unity and fighting for unity. This is how it works. With all lowliness and gentleness, with long-suffering. In other words, be patient. It's not going to be easy. Sometimes the other party will be very stubborn. Bearing with one another in love. St. Paul says love is the bond of perfection. You want to be perfect? Live in love. Live in the love of Christ. You will be perfect then. Because God is love. Endeavoring. Make it your endeavor, your plan, your goal, your project. To keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. It's all in there. The recipe is right there in this passage. And it's up to us. Don't wait for the other person. Don't wait for the other person. St. Paul wrote, Therefore, if there's any consolation in Christ, are you looking for consolation in Christ? Comfort of love in Christ, fellowship of the Spirit, affection, mercy. You're looking for mercy? This is how you do it. Fulfill 
my joy, St. Paul's joy, Christ's joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, not of one discord, but of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition. Don't have hidden agendas. Don't, don't let it be about you or conceit. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Be lowly in mind. Lowliness. He speaks of lowliness again. He said it in the, to the Ephesians. He's saying it to the Philippians, which means he's saying it to every church he writes to. St. Paul at that time. Which means that since it's being read today to each one of us, even in the 21st century, then it's even more relevant to us today than it was to them then. Let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about the body of Christ that must remain united. A body cannot be divided. If it's divided, the devil has dominated. It's right there. This is a famous passage we read this morning. You might not be able to read the font, so I'm going to read it out loud for you. When, it, when it's about people who disagree on something and how the consensus becomes God's will. It says, as we stayed many days, a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. When he had come to us, he took Paul's belt, bound his own hands and feet, and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt, and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Now, when we heard these things, St. Luke is writing, when we heard these things, when we heard that St. Paul is going to be bound hand and feet by the Gentiles, by the Romans, both we and those from that place pleaded with him. We begged St. Paul not to go up to Jerusalem. And Paul answered, What do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. So when he would not be persuaded, when they could not convince St. Paul of otherwise, it says, we ceased, saying, the will of the Lord be done. The will of the Lord be done. If you're praying the Lord's Prayer multiple times a day, saying, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, and not pursuing the will of God being done on earth as it is in heaven, then you're being a hypocrite. Then you're praying false, empty words. But when you truly work for the will of God to be fulfilled on earth as it is in heaven, then you are truly a Christ-minded Christian, not a self-minded Christian. And self-minded Christians are not real Christians, according to the Bible, not according to Abuna Peter, according to the Bible. And what were they arguing about here? They were arguing about not St. Paul getting hurt. They love him, he loves them. It was a very noble reason why they were pleading with him to change his mind. But even then, they finally said, the will of the Lord be done. If it's God's will for St. Paul to be arrested and bound by the Romans and killed, the will of the Lord be done. This is in this kind of message. How much more when it comes to everyday life and everyday situations, when we can't come to an agreement, where we should fight for unity and agree for consensus and say, the will of the Lord be done. If we're going to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We need to mean it. If we don't mean it, then we're praying false, empty words. And the Lord condemned those who did that in the gospel. When he said, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do. This is what he meant. Stop saying prayers. Oh, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. If you don't mean it, if you don't mean it, and if you're not really going to work towards it, then it's not real. This famous, uh, this man worked for the Eisenhower administration for the, in the United States government during the, I think Eisenhower was in the 50s, I think. I can't remember exactly. But he once said, pride is concerned with who is right. Humility is concerned with what is right. Ezra T. Benson. Pride is concerned with who is right. Humility is concerned with what is right. If we know what is right, it doesn't matter anymore. It's not about me or you, it's about right. Jesus is right, the way, the truth, and the life. If it's about what is right, then we can have consensus. It's not about, but I want my way to work. It's my way or the highway. That's not Christ-like at all. And we read this today also, this passage, St. Paul's letter to the Romans. He says, now I urge you, brethren, 
Note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned and avoid them. This is very serious. This is very serious. He's begging. This is his final words to the Romans, chapter 16. He says, I urge you, meaning I'm eagerly telling you, I'm almost begging you, brothers and sisters, note those who cause divisions, those who are dividing their homes with their bare hands, those who are dividing their marriages, those who are dividing their children, those who are dividing their colleagues, those who are dividing their churches. Note these people and avoid them. What do you mean by dividing them, St. Paul? Look at it carefully. He says, divisions and offenses. The Lord said, woe to those through whom offenses come. It would be better for them to have never been born than if because of their offense, one of these little ones should stumble. He says, it's better for them to have never been born. So you and I as true Christians need to be extremely cautious and careful. Am I a cause of offense in someone's life or even in the church? Am I putting a false image of humility or holiness, but yet living a dual life, living a double life? Do I come into church on Sunday presenting some sort of appearance of religious holiness and not real holiness, and then I can walk out moments after and forget everything that has to do with the church I was in or the message I was learning? He says, if I'm that kind of person, then I'm a cause of offense and I'm a cause of division and I should be avoided. If I'm that kind of person who does not strive for the unity of the kingdom of God within and without, when no one is looking, then I'm the kind of Christian, quote unquote, that should be avoided. That's what he's saying right here. This is really serious. This is really serious because I'm almost afraid to say that half of this world's Christians should be avoided, according to these words. Half of the world's Christians, which means that are we really Christians or not? Are we really striving for unity or not? It's very serious. I'm not the judge, God is the judge, but the words are clear, very clear. Mother Teresa once said, only humility will lead us to unity and unity to peace. If you don't have peace in your life, then maybe there's a lack of humility because there's no unity. It's a chain reaction. Humility will lead to unity. Unity will lead to peace. So we need to work towards the humility that leads to unity, which is the title of the word today. Remember how we said the devil tries to divide and conquer? When we live in the love of Christ, we unite and conquer. And that's why St. Paul says, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. You just want to conquer your sins? God is willing not only to make you conquer your sins, but to be more than a conqueror. Through Him who loves you. Through Him who loves every single individual. Because he goes on to say right after this, in the same passage, I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. When we remain in the love of Christ, as St. Jude said, nothing can separate us. The devil can never divide us, can never dominate, because the love of Christ compels us, the love of Christ constrains us, the love of Christ it keep, is what keeps us going. Regardless of the difficulty and the obstacles, regardless of the differences of opinions, we say, for the sake of the love of Christ, I will do anything to keep us united. For the sake of God's love, for the sake of Christ who shed His blood on the cross for me and you and us, I will do anything it takes to make sure we remain united, to make sure that we are never separated. The Lord said this very clearly after He washed the disciples' feet. After He said to them, you want to be like Me? If I, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. He continued the same passage and said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Don't just love yourself as I have loved you. Love one another is very encompassing. encompassing. It's very comprehensive. It's not just love the person sitting next to you because they're your son, your daughter, your wife, your husband. 
Make sure you love the people that are difficult to love. If your husband is difficult to love, love him. If your wife is difficult to love, love her. If your kids are difficult to love, love them. If your parents are difficult to love, love them. If your colleague, your boss, your neighbor across the street or next door, whoever is difficult to love, love them. Because that's how you become an image of Christ. That's how you become the image of Christ. As I have loved you. When Christ says, I love you, it's an everlasting love. And He didn't just love us, and He does not just love us when we're without sin. Why? Because we're always in sin. We always sin. The goal is to get up and not sin. If I have sinned, repent, get up and continue. Therefore, He always loves us, even in our sins. So He says, love one another the same way as I have loved you. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. If you truly strive to love everyone around you, all the way to loving your enemy, as Jesus commands us, which puts Christianity above every other thought, philosophy, religion, or belief, or cult, then everyone will know that you are the disciples of Christ, if you have love for one another. And if you want to achieve that, it's going to be by reminding yourself, what is the will of God? When he looked around him, and they said, your mother and brothers and sisters are seeking you, he said, who is my brother and sister or mother? For whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. St. Mary not only bore Jesus in her womb and nursed Jesus, she fulfilled the will of God by saying, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. This is how we have to be. And St. Mary teaches us that by simply saying, It's not about me. This is the conclusion. This is the conclusion. You and I have to get off our high horses, kick our ego in the stomach, and say it's not about me. It's about Christ. It's about the body of Christ that is united in Christ, who is the head, which the devil tries to divide, to dominate every day. And he wins with many people. But if I say it, it's not about me, then Christ will remain united within each one of us. And glory be to God forever and ever. Amen.